Good morning. Um, welcome to United Church of Fayetteville this week. Um, and I'm glad we could all be here to worship together. The peace of Christ be with you. Also with you.
friends, in this holy season, we gather in worship, praise, and prayer. We collect ourselves in order to reflect on God's word and draw nearer to Christ. Let us join our voices in song and open our spirits to the spirit of God. Together, let us worship the Lord. ancestors and faith have handed on to us an inspired word. Because of you, we know the rhythms of the spirit as well as the rhythms of the earth, leading us to new things in every time and place. Because of your faithfulness, we have received the gift of faith. May all that we have received, learn, and do show forth your glory and praise every day. Amen. People of God, so that we might be more holy as our God is holy, so that we may, so that we walk more closely with Christ, let us name the things that block our path from our desires. Let us make our confession together. Merciful God, we come to you a humble people, knowing that it is you who instilled in us the capacity to do good. It is you. Sisters and brothers, for us there is good news. God hears our prayers. 
In Christ we are forgiven and can live a new way. Having received this great grace, let us make our offerings of thanksgiving and praise. this day 
<clears throat> aware of the richness of the life you have bestowed on us. May our giving reflect your generosity and the wealth of blessings that we know. In Christ's name we serve and we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Please join me in our unison reading of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall, I shall not want. want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for the same sake. So wrote the psalmist, let us raise our voices in praise for God's enduring word. God's word to us continues this morning from the Gospel of John. It is the lectionary's recommended text for this day. It is another report of a long encounter that someone had with Jesus, as we did also have last week. I am reading selected portions. Let us listen carefully for God's word for us in this time and in this place. John wrote, as Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Jesus had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. And then the man went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying it is he. Others were saying no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They brought the Pharisees to the man, the, to the Pharisees, the man who had been formerly blind. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And the people were divided. The Jews did not believe that the man had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. 
We know that this man is a sinner. The man answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled the man who had been born blind and said, you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God had spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. So ends this report from the Gospel of John. God always blesses the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and especially the living of the Holy Word. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we ask for the gift of your spirit, that it might fill your word and our minds and spirits, that we might understand and live the way you would have us live, with your word growing more deeply in us and flowing through us into the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's enough in this text that we could probably have an entire Lenten series on this story alone, but we've got one Sunday. As I prepared for preaching this morning, listening for the Spirit's guidance, I kept being drawn back to the one thing in this story I understand the least and am the least comfortable with, the miraculous healing that drives the whole story. And I don't believe that I am alone in my discomfort with that. We have been exposed to a number of approaches for interpreting these miraculous hearings, that the victim's illness was psychosomatic, all they needed was a little psychological placebo to restore them to good health, that Jesus was some kind of first century Doug Henning performing before people more gullible than today's average eight-year-old, that because it's in scripture, we should just accept it without asking any questions of it, so not our tradition that it was some kind of theatrical deus ex machina inserted by the early church or the gospel writer to drive all that meaty discussion around it. Today, I'd like to spend some time not with these possible previously offered explanations, but with our discomfort. Jesus spat on the ground and made mud with and with the mud, made saliva, with the saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes. I'm not terribly familiar with first century state-of-the-art healthcare, but certainly from all reports, that was a messy healing for Jesus to perform. <laughs> Jesus called a met dead man back to life with a word, and it was by him a woman found herself healed simply by touching his robe. So what's with the spit and the mud? It's not just our germ theory educated society that recoils at the idea of such a cure. It didn't seem to make much sense to the people then who witnessed it or witnessed its after effects. The man told the story. Jesus slapped some mud over my eyes and then told me to wash it off. I did, and now I can see. And we can hear him tire of the telling throughout the reading until finally he refuses to tell it again. I've already told you. I'm done telling you. It's not just the man who once was blind who gets tired. We can hear the people's frustration. They ask, how did he do it? What they're asking is, how did it work? And the man can't tell them that. All he can tell them is, Jesus slapped some mud over my eyes and told me to wash it off. I did, and now I can see. Frustration becomes anger. Anger at the man who regained his sight. Anger at his parents for saying it's true. Anger at Jesus for giving him his sight. I don't think they're angry because they don't understand, or for that matter, care any more than we do, how dirt and saliva could restore someone's sight. They're angry because by its mere occurrence, such a healing offers more questions than answers. His disciples ask, 
Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? We add our own questions. Why does anyone have to be born with brain damage or developmental delays and challenges, deaf, lame, with a defective heart or the genes that will give them a deadly disease later in life? Why do people have to get cancer or suffer from mental illness? Why do some parents abuse their children? Why does the world allow millions of children to die of hunger? Why are some people allowed to rule, murdering thousands because of their religion or their color or who their grandparents were or simply because they stand in the way of more money and more power? Why? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He does not answer the content of their question or our questions, but he does address something that our spirits need to know. Such occurrences are not the punishments of God. Jesus begins to comfort us by assuring us that we haven't somehow deserved the things that have befallen us. If only Jesus had stopped there, if only he just stopped talking right there, but he continued. He was born blind, so that God's work might be revealed in him. Surely the God that we worship doesn't create suffering so that we know how wonderful and powerful God is. We don't want to worship a God who is a show off at human expense. We left that behind when we made the Lord our God before all other gods. We can live with a God who can't change things as long as we believe that God would if God could. Even then, Jesus had a chance to end the story in a comfortable and easy way, at least comfortable and easy for us, but he didn't stop talking yet. He could have, he could have stopped, he could have told a parable, drawn a picture in the dirt, but no. Jesus went on and gave the man his sight with mud and spit for Pete's sake. No lightning, no deep voices from the sky, no throes of exorcism. He didn't even make it look like work, which gives host to a whole new set of questions. If God can heal with mud and spit, why can't God put a stop to all these other things? Why doesn't God heal everyone? Surely God's works can be revealed just as well if we skip the pain. No wonder those people were angry. No wonder we'd rather skip the, or skim the miraculous healing and settle for the safer arguments of intellect. As long as this story is, for all the details that John includes, even the ones apparently important to him that don't add much to the story for us, there is a piece John left out, and it's one I really wish that he'd included. Wouldn't you have loved to be a fly on the wall when Jesus approached the blind man and whispered to him, look, I'm teaching a class. Some of my students have raised a question and you can help. I'd like to spit and make some mud with the saliva and put it on your eyes. Seems to me that it's almost a bigger wonder that the man let Jesus do it as that it worked. We've already established that mud packs were no more appealing as medical remedy in that day than this one. But there is more. From John's description, the man had to have heard Jesus' conversation with his disciples. He can't feel any better about it than we would, a person finding himself made into an object lesson. He'd have the same questions, the same feelings we would in those circumstances. John doesn't tell us if he argued or asked those same questions of Jesus, or even if he powdered and asked, why should I let you heal me to make a point when you wouldn't heal me before just because I'm me? John doesn't tell us any of those things. What he does tell us is that in the midst of the swirl of uncertainty and embarrassment, hurt, anger, and questions unanswered, the blind man allowed Jesus to put mud over his eyes, and he did as he was told. He went to the pool of Siloam and washed. Would you have? 
would I have? The question is not moot. For in some way, each one of us stands in the place of the blind man in a marketplace so long ago. Each one of us is in need of healing. We find ourselves in draining personal relationships that offer no life or bear no fruit. We have jobs which are not vocations. We have lost someone we deeply love and have not found our grief yet to be tempered with joy for the gifts they brought us. We want to try a new thing, but we are afraid. We ache that the discovery that the gift we dream of is not the one that God has planted in us. We have received the news that we will not live as long as we thought. And we hunger for the peace of knowing that God who loves us in this life loves us through all eternity. We are overwhelmed by the pain we encounter in the world and wonder if our life can make a difference. Each one of us is laboring in some darkness just as deep as the blind man's. Just as Jesus did for that man, so Jesus is offering to heal us. Will we let him? Or will we argue, argue meaning, means, and timing? The man went and washed and came back and was able to see. He discovered that the man who said, I am the light of the world, had the power to bring light into his world. John spent far too much time with such questions, doubts, and feelings, both before and after the healing, to even begin to suggest that such things are irrelevant or unfaithful. Yet what he does suggest is that if all these things are ever to find resolution, it will only be if we are in conversation with the one who is the light of the world the one who has the power to bring light into our lives and world. In this whole long story, that is the only answer John offers us. Please join me in prayer. Merciful God, your ways are beyond our understanding, but your love is not beyond our experience. Help us to live in the light of your love, even as we understand, strive to understand you and ourselves better. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let us be gathered again in prayer. Loving God, as we do draw near to you in prayer, we ask that we might feel your touch in the sensitive places of our lives, those places that know both our tender joys and aching pain, and all might know your presence. As we see children take their first stumbling steps or hear them utter their first stuttering words, as they come home from school, faces aglow with a new skill acquired, as they struggle, tongue between the teeth, to accomplish a difficult task, or weep brokenheartedly at the loss of a first love, we give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks for these gifts among us, the children of our homes and of our community of faith. We ask that in our thanksgiving, we might find the energy and purpose to reach out to all your children in the world, that each child might live out their created potential and each parent might know the joy of seeing it. Let us identify the childlike opportunities for growth, even in those of us who are tempted to think of ourselves as all grown up. Help us to work together so that through us, people will lie down in shelter nourished with food and with sense of your caring presence in their lives. Lord, even as we celebrate the growth and potential in us and all around us, we lament the limits of our abilities. We grind our teeth in frustration at bodies that no longer do what we expect. We grieve minds that can no longer name loved ones. We weep for those whose chair at our table is empty. We ache to comfort those who are dying and those who comfort them. We struggle to understand a world that prays for peace and goes to war in a hundred places. We wonder where the leadership will come from to help us wrestle with the enormous and complex tasks before us. Lord, fill us with your spirit and grant us your strength and undergirding presence. Open our eyes to the needs of our neighbors and help us to reach out in compassion and faith. Guide us that we may look inside ourselves and at our community of faith for the things the world needs. In all things, Lord, through us and in us, Work your purposes for wholeness and health. All this we pray in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who is art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.